All right. Hello and welcome, folks. So there is a lot to talk about. And I'll start off by introducing myself. Then we're getting into some lecture slides and go through the topic at hand. And then we'll have some time to review a lab or two and look at program design and how you might approach this clinically. And then we'll have time at the end for questions. Today's focus is women's health and the essential markers for breast and cardiovascular health and trying to tie this all together. A little bit about me. So I have been in practice for a while, um, 31 years now. Uh, let's see, is my video going? I think it is, yeah. Okay, I got a weird message there. And um, what we're really, what I'm really focused on in my career now mostly is, is, is less so working with patients and more so training practitioners. And I'm trying to find the areas in functional medicine that are kind of like the black holes <laughs> educationally, you know, and getting the practitioners that are interested in this work to sharpen their clinical application skills in those areas. That's really my main focus. And I should know about this because I've had a thousand black holes throughout my career that have been thankfully filled in by people like Richard Lord and Dr. Bill Timmons and various experts at lab interpretation that took me under their wing for anywhere from five to 10 years at a time to really teach me how to do the work. And so I'm trying to pass on that information uh, to you all. We do have this cardiometabolic health boot camp coming up, and you guys get a 20% discount uh, if you're uh, a doctor's data client. You use this code. You can also scan that QR code or write down or take a picture of that um, uh, DD23 code that you can use at checkout to get your 20% off. And this is a very lab interpretation focused class on testing and correcting the functional medicine variables with cardiometabolic health and mitochondrial function and why we make cholesterol and how we have high tri triglycerides and how we can correct all these different cardiometabolic factors. Okay, so that's coming up next month. And it's two months and it's pretty intense. If you have the time and energy, you really want to study on that. That's a good one. Okay, so now we want to talk, think about like from the biggest picture view of what we're really doing here is that we're working with people who are emotionally stressed, who don't eat very well, and who have a lot of pain and or hidden inflammation. And in my mentorship class, we review dozens of cases every week and every patient that we work with in that class, including everyone I work with in my practice, with the exception of maybe a few people who are actually quite healthy, are, have all these variables going on at the same time. And so I always want to have some general appreciation of the situation that we're in as practitioners and that you have to act as an emotional and spiritual guidepost, you know, for your patients. You have to eat really well and teach your people how to eat really well. And by the way, that pink frosted sprinkle donut looks actually gross to me. If it was me, I would have put like an old fashioned donut in there. But anyways, <laughs> and then, you know, make sure that you don't have any pain or hidden inflammation and that you can figure out the sources of pain and hidden inflammation in your patients, including GI pathogens and environmental toxins. And the subject that we're talking about today is, you know, squarely placed in terms of what your body is doing to metabolize or get rid of different forms of estrogen, and estrogen metabolites. And that has got a lot of overlap with GI function and liver detoxification function, as well as emotional stress and all these other variables. So I just want to mention that we're going to get deeply into a specific area today, but that we're always kind of in the background considering these bigger picture items. And if you fix someone's estrogen metabolites and they're an emotional and spiritual wreck, I mean, you probably haven't really helped them that much, right? So you want to have this other picture in mind. And so we always want to test and correct the hormones and all the cardiometabolic related components of a person's health, but also deal with the diet, et cetera. And, you know, when you're trying to fix a hormone problem, I think you'll find most of your patients that have pretty extensive hormone related issues are going to have gut and liver detox issues that are going to parallel the amount of problem that their hormones are having. So if you're running a HUMAP test to look at estrogen metabolites, you also need to run a GI360 to look at beta-glucuronidase in the microbiome, and you need to look at methylation capacity as well. You can't really isolate these things because they're all overlapping. And you, I don't think it really works for patients if you try to get a little uh, overly focused in one area. Um, you'll just miss the, the larger picture. 
The larger picture is much more important to maintain. And in fact, if you maintain the larger picture, and you could, if you just correct glutathione and oxidative stress and methylation and the gut, many of these problems that we're going to talk about today won't even be present because you will have corrected the underpinnings of the problem in the first place. Right? So the bigger picture that you can cast in terms of correcting things in the body, the more impact you're going to have on the hormones. And I think I see a lot of these um, uh, overly specific programs, like um, overly focused on one little thing, and they're missing out on the bigger picture. So I'm trying to provide a big picture lecture today a little bit, even though we're getting really specific at the same time. So emotional, dietary, detox-related stress. Those, that's kind of the theme, right? So now we have this test that Dr. Data spent a long time perfecting and bringing to us. And they have brought us color. They have brought us data. They have brought us a lot of information packed into this test. And we're going to look at just one little small subset of what this test is all about today. Okay. Uh, the HUMAP. And we were talking about this earlier. The HUMAP is sort of sweeping through the functional medicine community and people are getting into it because it's a really good test. And this is the cover page, and you can learn more about this later because I want to focus on uh, the details. So the And there's more slides in here than we're going to review. You have access to the slides, so the ones that I kind of skip by, skip over, are there for you to, you know, for your reference. Okay, so we have extras in here. So the clinically relevant markers on this test are color-coded. So you can see from the cover page, which is this page here, and now we're seeing the blow up here of the colors, exactly what's going on just at a glance before you get into all the specific data markers. And so this is extremely helpful, especially from a patient, well, to get yourself oriented, number one, and then from a patient education perspective, so you can show your patients what's happening, because they're not going to really want to look at the more detailed pages most of the time. Okay? And so you get these huge swaths of color. You have your red, your yellow, your green, your blue, and they're all color-coded to show, in general, what's happening with the marker. Red doesn't necessarily mean bad, and that's something you got to drill into your brain because most of the labs that we're used to looking at, green is good, red is bad. Red just means there's a lot of something, and sometimes a lot of something is good. And when I was first trying to understand estrogen metabolites, this is a long, long time ago, um, I learned about it, I went to all the conferences, and then I gave up because it was too hard to understand, for me at least at the time. I don't know, I was in my 30s or whatever, maybe I was too young to understand it or too distracted or I was sleep deprived because I was a little kid or I don't know what was going on, but it was just overwhelming to me. And so I kind of gave up on it. And it's been really um, a long journey to come back and to start to understand how useful and how important these tests are. Uh, because we're talking about breast cancer risk, it's a serious disease problem. And we had a patient this morning in the mentorship class that was just diagnosed with breast cancer. And we had our HUMAP. In fact, I should share it with the lab later because it's a really interesting case. Just diagnosed with breast cancer like this week. And the HUMAP just came in and it had high 4 hydroxy, that's the bad estrogen metabolite. It had low twos. The twos are the good ones. So this is what the take-home message today. The two hydroxy is the good one. The four hydroxy is the bad one. She had not enough of the good one, not enough of the twos, too much of the bad one, the fours, and she wasn't able to methylate and she had a lot of oxidative stress. We were just literally looking at the picture of breast cancer development in its early, early phases and then had a patient who was living that you know, and of course she's going through all this medical treatment. Of course she is, you know, but at the same time, gosh, all the things that we could do to help resolve this underlying physiological imbalance that's part of what's driving the cancer in the first place. So these are not cancer treatments by any means. And a patient like that is getting a full-blown cancer treatment program, but we can be supportive of this. And if you can catch a woman like that 10 or 20 years before the cancer develops, that's really what the goal is with functional testing, is to find the problems when they haven't yet expressed into a disease process. And we had a case like that as well last week. It was a young woman. She was like 27 or 28. 
And she also had low twos, high fours, not enough of the good ones, too much of the bad ones, a methylation problem, and a problem with oxidative stress. So in her case, no symptoms, no problems, no diagnosed problem from the medical folks at all. If we could get her twos up, her fours down, get her methylating like an amazing rocket ship methylation kind of person, and then lower her oxidative stress, you could really lower her risk of developing cancer later in her life. And so that's what this is really all about. Okay. So red is high, means high or abundant, but sometimes you want a lot of it. So with the two being high, that's good. The four being high, not so good. Okay. And then they have all these ratios. We're not going to worry about the ratios. If we can just remember the basic pathways today, you can calculate and figure out the ratios a little bit later. Similarly, blue doesn't always mean bad. Blue indicates low levels of a metabolite. So the four hydroxy, that's the bad one. If that one's low, then you're happy. Okay. Um, but Markers that can be pro problematic when they're low, that would include something like the good estrogen metabolite, the 2-hydroxy. And then there's these different ratios. Again, you don't have to worry about the ratios now. I just memorized the 2s and the 4s and the hydroxy, methoxy thing we're going to get into. Then you can calculate the ratios from that once you understand the um, basic premise. Okay, so now, this is one of these strange but true biochemical realities is that we take, and this is men and women both, but primarily we're talking about women today, we take estrogen in our bodies and we metabolize it or break it down into these different compounds. And some of these metabolites or some of these breakdown products can be potentially cancer protective. Some of them can be potentially cancer causing. So obviously you want a lot of the cancer protective breakdown products and not so much of the cancer causing kind. And methylation is smack dab in the middle of all this. And there's an enzyme you've all heard of called COMPT or C-O-M-T, COMPT, which stands for catechol O methyl transferase. And thankfully it's named for what it does. However, you're going to be thrown off by the first name because catechol, you're thinking catecholamine. Okay. So it's the same enzyme that breaks down dopamine and the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And for reasons that I don't understand, it's the biochemical situation, right? The design team set it up where that exact same enzyme that breaks down the catecholamines breaks down the estrogens that we're talking about today. Okay, and I know if you look into the biochemistry of it, you can see all the structures and why that happens and whatnot. But it's a little odd, just on the surface, that an enzyme that breaks down dopamine is also breaking down estrogen. But the key point to that enzyme is the methyl transferase part. It's methylating. So if you can methylate well, you're in great shape for part of what we're talking about today. And this is a diagram that shows methylation. And methylation is a little complicated. Methylation starts. With over here, you'll see origins of the single carbons. It almost sounds like an action movie or something. <laughs> origins of the single carbon. So there's a single carbon pool, and you have to get these carbons from somewhere. And guess where you get them from? Oddly enough, you get these carbons from amino acids, and there's only five of them. Serine, glycine, histidine, tryptophan, and glutamine. Those five amino acids provide the carbons that end up being what you are using to methylate. Because methylation is a process of taking a carbon and attaching it to something so something happens. In the case of COMP-T, the methyl transferase part of this, right, is you're grabbing a carbon and cramming it onto an estrogen to break it down. So if you don't have enough of these single carbons or if there's some other defect in the methylation process, you're not going to break the estrogen down very well. And this is a big problem. And so what do you need to make sure that this is working? Well, you need to have the amino acids, which ones? Serine, glycine, histidine, glutamine, and tryptophan. You have to have adequate amounts for those amino acids. And you have to have, as I'm sure you all know for methylation, B6, B12, folate, betaine, choline. Sometimes people supplement with SAMI, SAMI or methionine. But you need a whole variety of nutrients to make sure methylation is working. And here's a blow up of that that's a little more detailed. So we have our methylation cycle where methionine is going to homocysteine and this is sort of circling around there, right? And then off of that, we're getting these methyl donors and the nutrients again, 
B6, B12, and folate are the main ones that most people think about. But this diagram back here is just to remind you, hey, there's amino acids involved in this process also. So if you don't have enough of the single carbons, this thing's not going to work. Similarly, if you don't have the right amount of B12 or the right kind of folate and all that, it's not going to work either. Now, methylation defects would be uh, problem number one. Problem number two that would lead to estrogen metabolite issues is going to be oxidative stress, excessive oxidative stress. And we're all familiar with this. DNA damage is induced by oxidative stress. DNA repair, I guess not even DNA repair, but not, not allowing the DNA to be damaged in the first place is one of the jobs of the antioxidants like glutathione. So one of the ways that we can make up for problems with estrogen metabolism is by having enough antioxidants in the person's system. And if they have a lot of oxidative stress, then you're going to have a pretty big problem. And you have a lot of oxidative stress and low glutathione and poor methylation, you have two big strikes against you in terms of these different pathways that we're looking at. And here's a process of glutathione production and methylation yoked together. So here at the top of the diagram, you see it says oxidative stress. So if we're under oxidative stress, then we're going to obviously increase our glutathione production because that's sort of a master antioxidant, right? And as a process of doing that, we're also going to decrease methylation. There's only so much of this stuff to go around. So methylation and oxidative stress and methylation and glutathione production are tied together in a variety of different ways. There's other ways that they're tied together too, but under pressure, under the pressure of oxidative stress, we're going to preferentially make glutathione and methylation will suffer. There's other things that can operate in the opposite direction too, but we're mostly interested in glutathione for today's talk. All right, and you can measure all these things, right? You can measure glutathione, you can measure B vitamin status, you can measure amino acids, you can measure oxidative stress. You can test for all these things, so you're not just wondering. And here's another diagram that sort of ties some of these things together as well. Now, methylation profile. Look, it's a test for all this. You don't have to guess. Methionine, cysteine, esladenyl, methionine, how do you pronounce that one? Homocysteine, cystothionine. Look, they're all right here. And they have these ratios. So this is a direct measure of all this stuff, which is reflected in all this stuff. Okay? Now, when you look at methylation, the methylation profile, what they're measuring, look back up here at glutathione production. Look how intimately connected these are. Look, there's our cystothionine and cysteine or cystine, or both of them right there. Okay, they're all connected through these different pathways. Here's our homocysteine converting down into the cystothionine and cystine and cysteine, and then zoop over here to glutathione production. So all these pathways are directly connected. In other words, methylation and glutathione are yoked together, inextricably connected together. You can measure the methylation. If this is not working well, you know, you have to correct it. And that's going to start to get the ball rolling in terms of getting rid of the estrogen that you're trying to clear. Now, here's a section of the HUMAP with the various markers, the 2-hydroxy, 4-hydroxy. And if you're new to this, all you really should remember in the beginning is that the 2-hydroxy is good and the 4-hydroxy is the cancer-causing one. You can learn more about the 16 later, but that could be like next level. Wait, wait a few months, kind of digest this first chunk first. And then you'll see here these ratios. These ratios are showing you how one compound is, is converting to the next, how one metabolite is converting to the next. And that tells you a lot about the enzyme activity, the COMP-T or methylation activity. Remember, that's catechol o methyl transferase. So that enzyme is named for what it does. It's letting you know if you're methylating well or not. Are you breaking down these estrogens? And what you want to do is to break down the 2-hydroxy into the 2-methoxy, and you want to break down the 4-hydroxy into the 4-methoxy. And you can get some more detail on that later. But if you're not methylating well, then this problem, there can be a problem with the wrong estrogen metabolites building up. Okay? So that's methylation. And then look how convenient this is. Down here is the oxidative stress marker, a very famous, famous marker called 8-OHDG. 
pronounced 8-hydroxy-2-dioxyguanosine. And many of you may know, here, I've got the book right here. Many, many of you may have met or known uh, Walter Crinian. Um, can you see that? No, it's not really, it's kind of fuzzy for some reason. My camera's not picking it up. I'm not sure why. No, it's blurring it. Oh, you can't see it. Anyways, I'll read it to you. It's called Clinical Environmental Medicine by Walter Crinian and Joseph Pizzorno. This is the classic book on um, environmental toxicology. And Walter Crinian died a little while ago, which is one of the more tragic things. It was very sad. He was just a wonderful human being and really one of the founders of the field of environmental toxicology. And I had the great privilege to hear him speak. He wasn't a personal friend of mine, unfortunately. I wish I had known him, but I heard him speak many times. He was absolutely hilarious, like funnier than most stand-up comics, just a brilliant and funny man. And it was a talk in New York City, and it was several hours just on this one marker, 8-O-H-D-G, that we're looking at right now, in relation to breast cancer. Hour after hour of Walter going through the scientific literature on the connection between 8-O-H-D-G and breast cancer. So if you're interested in breast cancer prevention, this is for sure something that you could study. You could pick up a copy of Walter Crinian's book. Who knows? Maybe some of those lectures are on YouTube somewhere. Walter Crinian talking about 8-OHDG and breast cancer. And, you know, three hours after this, you know, three hours of listening to Walter and you're just realizing, wow, this is a really serious problem. And in fact, when I walked out of that lecture hall, the first thing I thought was it is worth the price of this entire test just to get that one marker there. OK, 8-OHDG. It's just kind of tucked in there a little subtly. You're not really thinking this is like a rock star marker. Rock star marker when it comes to breast cancer. If that marker is high, got a big problem. There's different reference ranges. Walter was very specific that he thought to be healthy, to have healthy breast tissue, you should maintain an 8-OHDG below a 4. That is not necessarily what the lab company is recommending. That's just straight from Walter's work. And so that's what I've adopted because because he was one of my heroes. I sort of worship the guy. And so I, you know, figured, hey, if Walter said that, I'm going to say that too, because the science behind it is pretty outstanding. Okay, so 8-O-H-T-G, you can see the ratios are going to be helpful for you to see what's happening with methylation. You don't have to memorize these ratios yet. Memorize the markers first, and then the ratios will start to make sense. Okay. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of studies here if you're interested in reading about things that talk more about estrogen metabolism in breast cancer. And there's another one. Again, you'll have copies of these slides. Uh, but there's a fair amount of work that's been done in this area on exactly what we're talking about today. Okay? DNA adduct formation, whatnot. Okay, so let's take a look here. And this is from one of those studies. This is a slide I grabbed out of one of those studies that we just looked at there. So and then let's just read this right from the, the bottom here. Estradiol is metabolized into 2-hydroxy and 4-hydroxy by CYP1A1 and CYP1B1, respectively. These catechols, catechols, undergo further oxidation into semiquinones and quinones that react with DNA to form depurinating adducts leading to mutations associated with breast cancer. And there's a bunch of other detail here, but let's just let's just try to make sense of this. So there's two there's a CYP1A1 pathway and a CYP1B1 pathway. And th there's under genetic expression you can measure the genes associated with the pathways here if you want. I don't do that very much in my practice, but I don't do a lot of genetic, genetic screening. Some of you may already do that. Estradiol breaking down to the 2-hydroxy. There's our COMP-T. Now we know what that is. That's methylation. But what does COMP-T mean? Methylation means those five amino acids need to be present. You have to have B6, B12, and folate. You have to have uh, the right amount of methionine and SAMI and choline and TMG. All these things have to be present. And then this enzyme works properly. And then you break the 2-hydroxy down into the 2-methoxy. And then you, know, you dump it out of the body. Alternatively, the CYP1B1 pathway, and again, you can read about this in genetics of the pathway if you want. 4-hydroxy, um, that's a potentially bad one. If COMP-T is working, it's broken down into the 4-methoxy and sort of neutralized. Here's where things can go bad. If you have a lot of the four, 
it can come down this way into these quinones. And the quinones can form DNA adducts. That means the DNA is being damaged. And that leads to abnormal cell replication and puts you at high risk for cancer. So what you don't want to have is the fours going down this way. That's the worst case scenario. And you don't want the twos going down this way either. You want the twos getting the exit route. This is like the exit door. Two methoxy is the way out. And the way out is guided by COMP-T on both sides. And that's methylation, which is right back to where we started the whole talk. Okay? And then what can prevent the quinones from going bad and turning into a damaging influence on the DNA is glutathione. And antioxidants can help reverse that potential process. So if you have antioxidants coming into the system and you're methylating well, this, the whole danger zone here is decreased. And so if you have patients like the two I've, we've just had last week, two of these, okay, back to back, if you have cases where the 2-hydroxy is low, you want to boost that up. The 4-hydroxy is high, you want to bring that down. And if they have a lot of oxidative stress, you want to lower that. And if they're not methylating well, you want to improve that. that those end up being the treatments. And I'll show you, we have specific slides on the treatments coming up. Here's another diagram showing the same one, same thing. So here's our CYP1B1. Here's our CYP1A1. Remember, going in these different directions. Here's our COMP-T. COMP-T, which is just a fancy way of saying the methylation process. So again, the same exact breaking down of estradiol into these different compounds. And now, here's that same stuff, but it's measured on the test. You can measure this. 2-hydroxy, generally considered safest. We're ignoring the 16, okay? 4-hydroxy, potential for DNA damage. So you want a lot of the 2s and not much of the 4s. And the test just lays this out for you. Clear as day. Here's our twos. Here's our comp T, that's methylation. So think of that comp T as being B6, B12, uh, folate, choline, methionine, right? Just think of it as nutrients. These are the nutrients that are making this happen the cofactors and nutrients, betaine, TMG, whatever you want to call it. That, this is the nutrients. And then to converting that two into the two methoxy so your body can get rid of it. And then over here, we got the four, that's the bad one. Same nutrients here, COMP-T, B6, B12, folate, methionine, trimethylglycine, choline, same exact nutrients are running this pathway. So instead of COMP-T, instead of the enzyme, think about it in terms of the nutrients because that's the treatment. So the four, you want to be broken down from the 4-hydroxy to the 4-methoxy because that's le you know, less risky, less damaging. And then they graph this out for you in a million different ways so you can see exactly what's going on on the lab. Okay, they have color-coded graphs so you can see exactly what's happening with each, with each of these metabolites and where the glitches are. Okay, graph after graph after graph. Once you memorize the pathways, then these diagrams start to make complete sense. But you need to study the pathways with a whole bunch of different diagrams. I must have looked at 20 of them, you know, different diagrams from different research papers, and then it starts to click. And then when you look at these diagrams, you're like, oh, I totally understand everything on here because I've seen this in 20 different ways. And, you know, this is like, I got a gripe here. I'm just going to go on a personal gripe moment here because there's no one to stop me. It's not like normally when you're at a conference and there's someone in the back that's looking at you going like, stop, don't do this, Kayla, stop, don't do this. Um, so, you know, the gripe is that we're supposed to be learning how to do this stuff and then looking at lab reports. OK, so you got to you got to look, read all these research studies. You got to look at all these different diagrams that the researchers put together for us. Memorize that, understand that, and then bring all that intelligence to the lab report. OK. You know, don't just rely on the lab report to teach you all these things. It's just not how medicine is supposed to work. You're supposed to know it, and then you go to the lab report, and then the lab report makes total sense. You're like, oh, I understand the 2, the 16, the 4. I read about this. Now you're seeing it in action on the lab. You know, that's the way that I think to really sort of capture this information. And here again are the different forms of estrogen. So you have the estrone or E1. Then you have the 2-hydroxyestrone, 2-hydroxyestrone, 4-hydroxyestrone, 16-hydroxyestrone, right? You have the 2, the 4, the 16, different metabolites. And then you have the methoxy. That's the one that's broken down from the hydroxy. And then you have estradiol. Same thing, the 2-hydroxyestradiol, 
4-hydroxyestradiol to methoxy, that's the breakdown product, and the 4-methoxy. If you go back here, that's what, if that, that's what I'm trying to make sense of this from. I have to put my glasses on here to see this. 2, okay, and then the 2-hydroxy, two, 2-methoxy, two E1, E2, E1, E2, E1 is estrone, E2 is estradiol, and then the 4-hydroxy and the 4-methoxy. M is for methoxy. Okay, so it's the same exact thing. This diagram is showing what's right here. Hopefully that makes sense. And we're ignoring the 16s now. When you read about this a lot, you'll see why. But you can study the 16s. I'm not against the 16s. I'm just not including them. Just because I don't include them doesn't mean I'm against them. But it's it's complicated enough. If you just learn the twos and the fours first, then you can notch the 16s in. They have this whole different pathway thing happening. Um, okay, so now you're all wondering, now I have to say something about it. I shouldn't open my mouth because no one would have noticed. But here's the 16. The 16 is going to estri estriol, to E3. Go figure, it's just how it works. But don't worry about that. It's not important. And then extra important, the 8-OHDG. Think of Walter Crinian and all the work that he did. Okay, so estrogens, the 2-hydroxy, estrone, 2 hydroxy estrone, and you can see it's written out there in different ways, 4 hydroxy estrone, and then the 16 hydroxy estrone. Twos are bad, fours, uh, twos are good, fours are bad, 16s are somewhere in between. And then, let's see here, estradiol, okay, E2, Again, the 2-hydroxy estradiol, that's one metabolite, the 4-hydroxy estradiol, another metabolite, and then the 4-methoxy estradiol and the 2-methoxy estradiol. And hopefully this, this is going to start to make sense after a little while. Now, because the, if we go back up here, remember the 2s go to the 4s. That's how the flow works. And I'm sorry this is so complicated. I wish it was easier, but the two, you see the two here? The two hydroxyestrone and the two hydroxyestradiol, they're converting to the two methoxy. Remember that? Okay, and here's the four hydroxy estrone and estradiol. The four is converting from the hydroxy four to the methoxy four. Okay, so that matters a lot over here because that's where these ratios are coming from. The 2-methoxy and the 4-hydroxy. The reason why the ratio tells you so much information is because what's standing between those two compounds is, is this enzyme that's methylating. So you can see how well the enzyme's working by looking at how well the 2 is converting, the 2-hydroxy is converting to the 2-methoxy. Okay, so this number, this is very important, this ratio of the 2-hydroxy on the right-hand side and the two methoxies on the left-hand side is showing you, let me show you the pathway one more time. It's a zoom in close up of this. So remember how I say comp T, you should just replace that with B6, B12, folate, uh, methionine, choline, trimethylglycine, because those are the nutrients that make this happen. If the twos are not converting from the 2-hydroxy to the 2-methoxy, and the 4s are not converting very well from the 4-hydroxy to the 4-methoxy. It means that these nutrients are missing. It's, it's, it tells you that the methylation capacity is not good. That's why these ratios matter so much, because it tells you if they're methylating or not. And that's the detail behind all this. You don't have to memorize every single thing I'm saying, but you should understand this. And then, thankfully, Doctor's Data is graphing this for you. So they're just going to tell you the relationship of the 4-methoxy and 4-hydroxy represents the activity of methylation, COMP-T, of the COMP-T enzyme. A low ratio indicates slower COMP-T activity. Not good, right? That's slow methylation. That means a higher potential for creation of quinones. Remember, the quinones are the extra bad things that can go on to form DNA adducts. So you want to increase COMP-T enzyme activity. So if the enzyme activity is sluggish, it means you're not pushing the metabolites into the next form, the hydroxy to the methoxy, and then you're going to be a high risk of cancer. So methylation matters a heck of a lot. And again, 4-OH 
E1 is considered unfavorable due to its carcinogenic potential within breast and prostate tissue as a reactive metabolite. When methylated by COMT, it's broken down, this reactive metabolite becomes stable, and then you can get it out of your body. However, and this is a big however, how do you get it out of your body? I don't know. Someone put your hand up. I wish we were live. You know, I've missed all the live conferences I used to do all the time. But anyways, first of all, you have to get it out through your gut. And you have to get it out through your liver. Your liver and your gut have to be working decently for all this stuff to happen. Okay? So now, if those enzymes aren't working well and stuff is building up, there's this term that was coined a long time ago called estrogen dominance. Doesn't mean that your estrogens are necessarily high. But estrogen dominance means that the balance of estrogen and progesterone is off. Okay? And it can mean that the estrogens are high. But high levels of estrogen can put women at higher risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer. The easy way to process that when you're talking to patients is just to let people know estrogen is a growth hormone. It causes things to grow. And in addition to all these problems we're seeing with the metabolites, if you're estrogen dominant in and of itself is going to be a problem, even if you're metabolizing estrogen well. And it causes other problems like autoimmune issues, thyroid issues, diabetes, et cetera, implicated with high levels of estrogen. So to get all this corrected, we want to fix the detox pathways in the liver so your body can just clear estrogen, clear estrogen, clear estrogen, just get out what it needs to get out so it doesn't build up. And you do away with this estrogen dominance. You're going to have to get environmental toxins cleared out of the body too because you only have one liver. It's not like there's, the liver is compartmentalized and there's part of it that's doing estrogen clearance and there's another part over there that's doing mercury, benzene, toluene, and there's another part for arsenic, right? It's just one liver trying to do its job. So the more that your liver is overwhelmed with environmental toxins, the more poorly it's going to perform in, in, in terms of clearing estrogens. And then you have to fix the gut. And there's a very famous marker on the gut testing called beta-glucuronidase, which will give you a lot of information about what's happening with estrogens, but from the stool test, from the GI360. So the GI360 is a must-do test as part of a woman, women's health workup. GI360, even if they have no digestive problems, makes no difference. If she has a microbiome, you got to test it. Okay. And what you're looking for in regards to specifically what we're talking about today is this one marker called beta glucuronidase, as well as the overall status of her microbiome, because the microbiome has a lot of control over what's happening with hormones. You want to balance these other hormones too, like progesterone, thyroid hormones, adrenal hormones. There can be genetic components to the COMT problem, and we've all heard of MTHFR genetic related issues there and if you're into genetic testing do it you know absolutely two of my close friends and colleagues ben lynch and nathan morris are, are experts lifelong studiers of mthfr and i just learned through osmosis hanging out with those two people uh super important super important if you want to do the genetics um you don't have to though i'm more into the functional testing and seeing if we can just fix it from a functional standpoint. But if you want to layer the genetic studies on top of it, it gives you a lot more power to what you're doing. So that's great. And then we've already talked about glutathione, and that's one of our main antioxidants that's going to prevent the potential damage that occurs from DNA uh, adducts. And that's going to intervene at that level of the quinones that we saw. And then NAC and resveratrol have been shown through studies to also reduce formation of uh, estrogen DNA adducts. Okay, so glutathione, NAC, resveratrol, hitting all the antioxidants, folate, B6, B12, methionine, choline, TMG, hitting all the stuff for methylation, and you've got the system well in hand. There are specific supplements for specific problems, and one of them that's famous is called calcium deglucurate. So this stimulates phase two glucuronidation. And that's going to help with a variety of things. On the stool test that we're going to look at in a few minutes, if you see high beta-glucuronidase, many people use calcium deglucurate to deal with that. What happens when the beta-glucuronidase goes high, and this is again on the stool test, is it means that the body is, uh, well, there's a problem with the microbiome, which drives, it's a bacteria in the gut that drives the beta-glucuronidase high. But when the beta-glucuronidase is up, it prevents the ability, ability of the body to dump estrogens out, okay? And so instead, you can recirculate estrogens back into the bloodstream. So that's a problem. Calcium deglucurate is used to prevent that. DIM is another compound 
that's related to the cruciferous veggies, the cabbages and cauliflowers and broccolis of the world that is also used. And many of the supplement companies we work with have a combination product because people always ask me, which one should I use? Calcium deglucurator or DIM? And I'll say, I use the one that has them both in it. So um, you can use one, you know, any of the major supplement companies will have a product that has calcium deglucurate and DIM in it together. So you don't have to make the choice of which one to use. And this comes back to the, just the very strong argument for eating broccoli, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. And um, it's not Brussels sprouts, it's Brussels sprouts. And I had to check that. I, I, I didn't know that until I put this slide together, uh, but it is. It's spelled with an S, uh, named after Brussels. Um, I guess Brussels isn't really a word. I always thought it was. Anyways, it's the sulforaphane that we're really after. So every time we get a hormone case in my in my mentorship class, is someone that puts their hand up and says sulforaphane for treatments. It's almost like a joke now. So I try to like preempt them now. I'm saying, and you can use sulforaphane. I got to try to get that in before someone else gets their hand up. So sulforaphane is one of the primary treatments for all these things. In fact, sulforaphane is a treatment for just about anything. If you saw my big fat Greek wedding, that dates me because that movie was like 100 years ago. The guy, I think he had Windex. His cure for everything in the world was Windex. He like sprayed it on to clean stuff. He sprayed it on like people's cuts and whatever. He sprayed it everywhere. So sulforaphane so works for everything. Okay? So now how do you increase the good one? The 2-hydroxy sulforaphane, so indole-3-carbinol, omega-3s, curcumin. And of course, as we've been saying for the last... 36 minutes or whatever, methylation support nutrients, right? But so far, is at the top of the list because it's a really good one. Do you have to use all of those? No, probably not all of them, but depending on how severe the case is. So estrogen metabolism also impact, impacted by xenoestrogens, the chemical compounds that mimic estrogen, excess body fat, alcohol is obviously going to impact liver function. We just have to get everybody to stop drinking alcohol. Maybe not forever, I don't know if you're going to France and you're going to be in Southern France for a week. Okay. Drink some wine, you know, but for a lot of the patients that we're working with, they just need to stop booze like completely, not a little bit, but all the alcohol. And there's no point in working with someone's estrogen and their liver if they're drinking every day. Okay. They have to stop the alcohol to be successful at these programs. And then the comp T pathways, I've been saying this whole time, B6, B12, folate, magnesium, they call TMG, betaine, trimethylglycine, whatever you want to call it, it's the same exact thing, SAMI, methionine, and you want to reduce stress. That's kind of true for every single thing that we do here. So again, most of the companies that we work with will have a methylation support type product that has combinations of things in it for you, so you're not giving out six or eight different bottles of stuff. Um, and, oh, you see how I did this? This is like a trick slide. Okay, so this one here, COMP-T pathway treatments, all right? This one, methylation treatments. It's the same slide. That's just me messing with you. That's just me saying COMP-T treatments are methylation treatments because it's catechol o methyl transferase. It's the same thing, same, same. So you're treating, you can't just treat part of, you know, methylation in one context. You're treating methylation everywhere in the body when you treat methylation. It's a global treatment. And here's like a review slide just to see where we have come from and what we're doing here. And let me just go through this. Estradiol, there's our CYP1A1, okay, over there. And that's going to the 2-hydroxyestradiol. There's our COMP-T. But you see COMP-T, you're going to think B6, B12, folate, magnesium, TMG, SAMI, methionine. That's what you're thinking. It says COMP-T, but you're thinking all the nutrients there. That's converting the 2-hydroxy to the 2-methoxy to make it stable, harmless, okay? What you don't want to have happen is the 2-hydroxy to not go down the methylation pathway because you can't methylate. Why? If you don't have enough B6, B12, you don't have enough folate or magnesium, then you're going to go this way down to the deadly bad, bad pathway to the quinones that are potentially cancer-causing, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And then over here, we have the CYP1B1, and here's our 4. That's the 4. You know right away that's the bad one, 4-hydroxy. But you can nuke the 4-hydroxy with COMP-T and turn it into the 4-methoxy and neutralize it. All right, that's good. If you can't do that, you can nuke it over here, the dynamic over here, with glutathione or other antioxidants to prevent these quinones from damaging DNA. So 
Methylation and oxidative stress prevention are like the main treatments here. Here's another diagram of methylation. Oh yeah, and here are the supplements. Choline, betaine, B6, B12, folate, sometimes methionine or SAMI. And you can test for this. We just I showed you the test just a minute ago. You can test for all this. Liver detox pathways, you want to take into account phase one and phase two liver detox clearance as well. And then here's our basic. Make sure you understand the methylation support. I just showed you that. Antioxidant support. That's um, resveratrol, glutathione. Remember we looked at that? And NAC, resveratrol, glutathione, and NAC. The DIM and calcium deglucurates of the world or indole 3 carbonyl to remember that's the sulforaphane kind of stuff. Okay. And then diet and lifestyle, super important part of all that. Okay. So let's take a look at labs. And we just, we already looked at the labs pretty extensively, but I just want to show you a quick peek. First of all, the doctor's data GI 360. Just take a deep breath every time I see this. It's like, it's like going to a car show and someone comes up in a, 1950s Ferrari or something. You look at this test, at least so much goodness here, okay? Dysbiosis index, diversity score. I know we're not talking about that. We don't have time, but you guys, you should know all this. It's so important and you can help so many people if you figure out this yeast overgrowth, but we're there's just one marker we're hunting for on this test. And it's down here. The bottom, you see the one that says beta, beta glucuronidase. If beta-glucuronidase is high, that means that there's gut bacteria that are generating this high beta-glucuronidase, which is causing a potential recirculation of estrogen. So that's a gut slash hormone marker. And it really shows you that the more damage that the gut has, the more dysbiosis, the more bad bacteria, the more yeast overgrowth, the more potential there is for hormone imbalances. That's just a nice way to kind of see that. And then let's just look at one of these tests in its entirety. We've already said red means the marker is abundant, not necessarily bad, but it can be bad. Blue means the marker is low, can be bad or good, depending on which marker it is. And there's a lot of reverse things here, right? Because the two hydroxy is good, so we want a lot of it. The four hydroxy is bad, so that being low is actually good. And I don't know about you, but I had to study this for quite a few years till it really sunk in and I had it all memorized because there's, it's just complicated. It's just a lot of detail. But if you scan through this test, you'll see the section that we're talking about down here. And here we go. Here's another example. Now these diagrams may be hopefully starting to mean a little bit more to you. Here's our two hydroxy going to the 2-methoxy, the 4-hydroxy going to the 4-methoxy. What's determining that is COMP-T. What's determining whether you go down the 2 or the 4 pathway in the beginning is potentially your genes, right? Your genetics, CYP1A1, that's the good one. CYP1B1, that's the bad one. So there's some genetic determination of all this as well. And then here we have it broken down into the individual metabolites ones that are related to estrone or E1, and ones related to estradiol. Now, if you're thinking, I know there's a third estrogen called estriol. Why is it not on there? It's because estriol is involved in this other pathway with the 16, and we're not talking about that. It's not like someone forgot. It's, just, it's purposefully not there And um, in terms of all this detail, okay? When you see the ratios and everything, they, they report it here. But we're going to kind of de-emphasize that because it ends up not being as important. And then here we have all the ratios that are super important that tell us about the uh, methylation activity. You're measuring whether the body can methylate or not. Okay. So a program could include simple protocol, could include all these markers, all these uh, supplements that we were just looking at that relate to methylation. Like a simple program could be this stuff, maybe in a combination product. Um, and then depending, obviously, on the lab show, you might have some NAC, resveratrol, and glutathione mixed in there to handle the COMP-T problem and the oxidative stress issue as well. And then there's other treatments that we mentioned here. 
that you can do to drive two hydroxy up. There's a lot of lifestyle stuff you can do. It turns out all the things that are good for us, like exercise and eating healthy and sleeping well, all that helps the good estrogen production. But supplement-wise, it's these guys. Sulforaphane, DIM, omega-3s, and curcumin. Okay? All right. So let's open it up for questions now.